Yeah, uh, well, I'm, I'm Javiera, and I'm a senior lecturer in teaching and learning enhancement at the University of Suffolk. And I'm so happy to be here with my colleague, Leo, uh, Christian, and, and Caroline uh, to present this workshop. As you can hear, I have a dreadful voice today because I was hit by a bug. Um, so um, I'm going to try to kind of speak the, as little as I can. Um, and uh, the idea of today is just to have a conversation about data ethics and research ethics and how we can work beyond the classic concept of data skills, so managing, storing, uh, collecting data, and kind of embracing a concept that is quite interesting. It's called ethics as a, met ethics as a method. So, um, I'm just going to let Christian and, and Leo to, to, and, and Caro to, to introduce themselves. And, and the idea is to have like a most interactive and kind of chatty uh, participatory uh, event today. So Leo and Chris and Caro. Thanks, Javi. So um, hi, everyone. I'm Leo Havman. Some of you may have seen me presenting at Gurdjian very recently and already be sick of me um <laughs> and um but this is about another um totally different thing that i've been up to with um with the, this um i can't remember what marsh called us this rogues gallery <laughs> um we've been doing working on this um project about um critical data literacy um it's um it's been really uh, exciting and interesting work that um i'm thrilled that we're going to share it with you um but um but yeah i should explain i am also um, a current PhD student at the Open University in um, Open Education um, with a kind of policy for open education focus. Um, and also I uh, am a digital education advisor at University College London. Should... Chris, do you wanna? Okay, yes, I'm Christian Timmerman. I'm a philosopher from a background. I'm a research associate at the University working mostly in medical ethics here in Germany, and uh, I've yeah been working with and especially with Leo and uh, Javier now for three years or something like that. We've known each other for longer, and um, so my input is mostly the ethics part here in the project. In uh, Caro, yes. If you can hear me, I, I won't put my camera on because it's very, very weak, the internet where I am at the moment. So I'm Caroline Kuhn. I'm a senior lecturer at PASPA in the School of Education. And um, yeah, I've been working, well, we have been working together in this project for about a year. And I'm really thrilled to share this wonderful workshop that, um, yeah, I think it's it's very needed, as, as we will see. And um, yeah, with further ado, I just um, say I'll be here. I might be very interrupted. Again, I'm really sorry, but the internet is incredibly dramatic where I am at the moment. So yeah, thank you. Okay, th thanks um, everyone for the intros. Um, so I, I hope that you can all see the um, slides that I'm sharing because I forgot to the obligatory check that everyone sees them um, and um, so we thought as a um, opening um, kind of um, interaction um, in this workshop because we don't want it to be just us uh, talking at you um, then we would start by having a little um, uh, well a, a, an activity to think about data buzzwords and buzz phrases and I'm just going to um, now switch into um, my menti screen um, and hopefully you might see the link to, you can just click the link from the chat to get to the response screen. I'll just pop it back in the chat again. Um, is that working okay? So, uh, so this is the, the question, what are some um, industry, government or academic buzzwords and buzz phrases describing the recent rise of data? So we, we have, oh, it's closed. Thank you for um, letting me know. That's very useful. Okay, hold on a sec. <laughs> So 
Okay, so just start thinking about this question while I um, try and open the presentation. It, it looks open to me. Okay, I was gonna say, it, it says it's closed to me. I'll try to fetch it, but maybe it's, it's okay for everyone else to see. Um, yeah, of course, technology boycotts the learning technologies. It's, it's part of it's the- It's very strange because I sent the link earlier to Javi to look at it and it worked then, but what have I done wrong? Can you try that one? What? Still close to me. What about for you, Beck? Anyone else? Sorry, hold on a second. Okay. Yeah, it's still oh. close to me. Yeah, it's still close for me as well. Well, actually, in the meantime, we can have, while Leah try to restore the machine, <laughs> uh, we can have this kind of conversation in the chat because there's always an alternative uh, solution for things. So we, we like to know which kind of the buzzwords at which you hear industry and governments referring to data. Yeah, yeah, we like the concept of new oil. Yeah, Paola, uh, big data as well. Coding, ooh. <laughs> yeah, digital colonialism inside. That's one of the terms I like, digital colonialism. Extractivism. <laughs> Let's see if it works now. No, it says voting closed. <laughs> Still. Don't worry. Um, we'll 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 try. Yeah, big data. It's let me see if I can just post paste this into our. I'm gonna, gonna try one thing. If I can paste them into the presentation. Uh, yeah, it's it's quite interesting the ways in 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 in, in which people is referring to um, to data, uh, and it every day is a new buzzword. Uh, and everyone's trying to get more innovative in, in the way that they, they talk about data, but but basically, digital colonialism is one of my favorites. Um, but I also say like digital in kind of space invaders and can also be a good concept for how data has been used. Just it should be working actually now, I think. But, okay. Sorry, keep um <laughs> keep discussing. If anyone wants to take up the mic as well, just let us know. It's just I'm doing something really ridiculous in here, so. It works for me now. Oh, okay. Can we give it a try then? I'm just copying the, the concept, the context, the concepts in between. Uh, now it's working. Yeah, perfect. It's working now. Yeah, unwitting reproduction. I like that one. Targeted intervention. <laughs> All right, let's have a look. Can you see the results? Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, it, it's quite interesting on how, which which are the buzzwords used to. Um, as catchphrases to talk about, about data and 
and and and normally they, they use it in the context, for example, of policy, yeah, to promote or or discuss or discuss a policy. But the implications of policy and the impact of policy, of sorry, the impact of, of, of data and the impact that uh, mismanagement of data is having in the society, it's way beyond what we were expecting in, in, the, in the last years. I think the way that data has been used um, and colonizing, um, invading and surveilling us, it, it, it's quite horrendous. So I, th I think when we, when we look into, um, into how conduct research ethically and beyond sometimes beyond the policy regulations of, on, on data, how we can do things better than policy, is something that we really, really want to engage this, this group in. Leo? Yeah, so I mean, uh, just um, here were some ones that also that we were thinking of um, of earlier. And I think um, you, you have picked up on quite, quite a few of these. Um, I, I love the um, use of, um, of um, the AI, um, sort of um, acronym to refer to automating inequality um, as well as to artificial intelligence. Um, and um, yeah, data is the new oil. Um, Javier and I both came up with when we were thinking of like, what are some, what are some of our um, data um, buzz phrases? Surveillance capitalism has been su such a um, sort of um, widely discussed um, hot topic and I think so relevant in education. And also an awful lot of this stuff about personalization, um, the idea that the the um, the, the algorithm, um, much as it can can recommend you um, or the products that you're going to really love, is going to uh, recommend you the learning that you um, that you need. Um, and um, and really, we can um, yes, Martin. I can't believe you didn't say it. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, um, and that this is going to, you know, really, um, as Audrey Waters talks about this, this idea of teaching machines, you know, the idea that the, the algorithm and the, 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 the teaching machines can replace the actual educator um, is um, kind of held up as, you know, by some as, you know, one of these kind of great um, new goals for um, technology and education. So let me return to the slides. Um, yeah, yeah and, and they keep personalizing things that we haven't even asked them to personalize. It's like literally Google Scholar, I can find my own literature. I don't need you to get, uh, send me an algorithm, like have an algorithm to tell me what to read. I don't have time to read any more things. Thank you. So don't bombard me <laughs> with, with more free things. Avi, this is you. Sorry, you're muted. Uh, of course, I'm muted. And and I, I asked for uh, I, for Christmas. I've asked a T-shirt that says "I'm muted." Um, one of the things that we've been we've been saying, and as for for those that haven't read anything that Leo and I have done, and I actually understand, please please don't. Um, we've been talking about this for quite a long time. Um, one of the things that we've been telling recently, and this is in, in, in our uh, chapter in the book of the state of open data, we said that data is, is never neutral. This thing about neutral raw data, mm, not really. Data is collected with an intention. So there is no such a thing of neutrality in data. Data is ultimately a political instrument. Uh, so uh, the algorithms used to analyze the data bring in the bias of whoever is dealing with such data. Uh, and this not just us when we think about all this discrimination and marginalization and segregation, is not just a, the big data, big companies concept. It's also something that we can, because we all have embedded data, so embedded biases. So our internal kind of, let's say, algorithms are biased. We are biased as, as, as humans. So when we analyze the data without this ethical lens, we can stigmatize, segregate, and discriminate our people. And this is something that without knowing, without, without willing to do, it happens, for example, when we work with learning analytics, we have a preconception of which are the students 
they are quite likely to fail because of their race, their background, their ethnicity. So this is something that we need to keep when we are dealing with data, big, small um, research, not research, whatever we're doing with data, we need to be very critical because it's data, it's, it's a political instrument. Chris, uh, that's yours, I think. And you're muted. Actually, it is yours, though. And I have a cold. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. No, the, the distinction about in uh, here between privilege and uh, right is, is that we, as researchers, should not assume that we can uh, in, uh, use this uh, data as a resource in any way we like. It's a, it's a conditional in uh, use. So, so therefore, privilege. And for in in order to be able to make use of that privilege, one has to follow as, as certain um, uh, parts of in a good conduct that in uh, allows the, that also future researchers will be able to use it, and that in uh, people will be still willing to uh, make data available. So this is briefly me. I think I think that's me. And um, our, our work is it, it, grounded on, on the idea of like using data critically. When, when we first started working with this in, with, with Leo many, many years ago, we come from the open education and OER background. And at some point we thought, well, if all these sort of resources are promoted as OERs, why data is not included? Because part of my other work, as you know, every precarious academic has a side job. Um, my job was dealing with data and open data at government level. So, um, <coughs> sorry. We thought about, well, if the governments are opening up data, why this data is not used as an academic, as like a pedagogic kind of tool to, to, to teach at, at HE, for example. So, this is what we started thinking okay, if governments are opening up data to foster participation, then a good way to foster critical participation and kind of critical thinking is through kind of embedding open data as another OER. But then in between when we started exploring this around 2014 and how things have changed until today uh, with the datafication, kind of extreme datafication of the society, um, is not just having a statistic literacies, for example, is not just having understanding graphs and, and, and other uh, kind of statistical methods. Um, it, it's about understanding datafication itself, is understanding how data has been used to manipulate opinion and how it's used to manipulate politics. And also having the critical thinking is, is, is a core skill and it needs to be transversal when we talk about data, because this is a way to enable participation in democracies. And, and generate said something, um, I think it was Mariana who was talking in, in the chat about data sovereignty and, and having the sense of ownership about your data to challenge our interactions with data-driven systems. In the, a data-driven system nowadays is actually the government platforms as well. So yeah, that's... I just wanted to pick up um, a little bit about the, this this idea about um, open data as OER because I think this is um, quite relevant for the kind of Gojian um, audience and why why that still um, kind of remains quite core to the the work that that we've been doing because I think that what what we've seen is that um, when we when we started doing that work, there was a lot of kind of positive vibes around the idea of opening up data, making sure that data is all um, accessible by the public. The open data movement itself was, um, uh, in in many ways, like the OER movement. There was sort of a, a a sense that if things are made open and available, then 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 people people can use it. People will do great stuff with it. It's um it's all about opening it. Um, and um, and then you know these things always turn out to be a little bit more 
more complicated than just being um, just sort of being online with an open license. Um, and um, and we've seen the kind of explosion in the in the interest in and the concern about data and the way data is used um, throughout society and the, the, the phenomenon of datafication and and actually a lot of that data that we're now um, more um, concerned about is not really the the open data so much as the the data that we we don't know that they have the data that that um, especially corporations are um, collecting and, and using in various ways. Uh, but we still actually think that, that the um, thinking about open data and working with open data as a pedagogical approach to building um, kind of uh, building uh, critical data literacy is um, is vital because um, after all, this is the data that people actually can have access to. And this is also um, the kind of data that tends to be opened up is actually really important because this is quite often um, coming from um, from governments, from uh, research organizations, or um, kind of civil society organizations, that it, it, th th these are these are kind of data sets from which people are drawing like quite important conclusions about um, about what's going on in the world, about where we should allocate resources to, um, about kind of um, you know what what sort of um, groups are more successful or more privileged or more um, needy or, um, you know, all, all of these kind of um, things are actually um, able to be um, looked into um, sort of in, within that context of open data. So this uh, kind of leads on to um, the discussion, I think, of our project. Um, the data practice, um, understanding data practice and politics. Um, Carol, yeah. are you are you here? Yeah, I am. I am, but I'm not sure if you can hear me. That's my question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I went to the street because I think there the signal is better. So if you can um, click the links for me uh, once I tell you, Leo, that would be great. So just to say. Um, one word about what Leo was saying is, is that that was materialized in the Uruguay chapter of this project that was led by Javi and Virginia Rodes and people at the University de la República in Nucleo Rea, where there was an incredible hunger, if you want, for people, they wanted to learn more about open data, open data as open educational resources, the critical literacy of data, how can I use it? It was eye opening. So I think that yes, there is an important issue here that is, you know, it is really there and we can see it. And so what we have created in our OER, which is um, a WordPress site, and here's like the map of it, we created some content we created uh, that are modules and these modules are listed in the slide that um, we, yeah. So there are these four modules and that is an ongoing process. Um, we have resources. There is particularly, I wanted to say what Leo was saying, there's an incredible interesting podcast with Luigi Reggi and he is doing in Italy such a good project with schools and data and open data. And it's amazing, the project. And there in the podcast, you can hear about it more. We have also created webinars and they are all listed and they are all open to use and, and, and properly um, accessible for you. And we have also created some workshops and one of them being um, uh, guided by the Open Data Institute. And we learn how to use the data ethics canvas we designed what we called a thinking tool. I'm not sure, Leo, if you're able to just browse that one for me, if you're so kind. Oh, that's great, Mariana. I'm glad that you have read them and that I have served you. Um, yeah, so the thinking tool, there you go. So that's, I, you know, I think it's a really useful tool, well, we think, because it allows participants to think about complex problems that are maybe around open and closed data, which we know is never either or, but it's a combination of. And you can, you can think about the y-axis as aspects of the context that you're working in or the things you're considering in. And so people can start to think about the problem and where would they put the problem? Is it in the first quadrant, in the second, in the middle, a bit, a bit. So it's a, it's a tool that allows for analysis. And of course, as every analysis, there is a lot of things that we cut off in order to understand um, social reality. 
We also have there in the tools, there is this, um, well, there are many things. One thing is the framework, the data ethics framework, which we're gonna talk about today. And again, it's a tool that allows teachers or community educators or researchers or whoever is interested in to use that particular tool to think ethically about the use that they are giving to data. Um, we have in resources and publications, the modules that are um, in PDF format and you can download them, you can use them. Um, they are CC licensed, you know, you can make the best use use out of them and we also have um, a, a, a part in our site where our participants or the participants of, of whoever is is, is um, giving this um, course to upload their materials their working materials the idea is that people can nurture whatever they're doing with materials and work of others so you can learn from the work of others and I think that's truly an open educational um, there are plenty of things there for you to explore. I think there is everything there to, yeah, to just run a course, an open, you know, open course, which is, um, yeah, complete, I would say, with the things we have there. And what Leo was saying, I also wanted to say that being the resources open and there available is one thing, but guiding and um, accompanying people in the process of learning is an important thing that we have realized in our all four chapters that we did. So being there and giving the guidance, giving, you know, the com intellectual company, if you wish, or pedagogical company is an important thing so that the OER really en en enacts or materializes the benefit, the pedagogical benefits that we have thought with them. And I hope you could hear me. I'm, I'm not sure, but I hope, yes. Yeah, thanks, Carla. One, one of the things that we did as, as a team as well was curated a lot, a lot of readings because we lot, we lot, we like to read. So in each one of the modules, you will find some, some readings. Some, and also, if you want to use these materials to teach, you have the lessons with a proper lesson plan. So we have uh, learning outcomes and activities for the classroom. So if you just want to use it to run workshops, feel free to, to use them. Yeah. If you go to one lesson, then you can see the activities. Yeah, it depends. Not all of them have one, but some of them have. Yeah, I think we try to put most of them. <laughs> uh, it's organic. Yeah. I think it evolves with the use. There you go. There it is. There is one. Yeah. So there are, you know, there are plenty of, of, of things really to, that are there to start and use it. It's, it's, I think it's, yeah, <coughs> quite rich. Yeah, I think we we um we definitely are still um uh, working on the challenge of uh, crowdsourcing um some some posts from people who've um who've done some some work with with these resources. So um so if you do get inspired to um, do anything with them and want to write write a little post about what you've done with it or the kind of um, findings or feedback from um, from the um, the, the people who participated um that would be that would be amazing um and uh, leo, I want to translate sorry, sorry them. To interrupt you, leo there is mm -hmm. in in each of these modules where the downloadable pdf is there is a form that we have put in if you want it's not compulsory of course but if you want to share with us how you're using it and how it can be you know adjusted or whatever, the, how are you using it is of interest for us. So there is a form, you can fill it, and then you help us to just organically, I would say, um, yeah, just, you know, improve the versions of it. Thanks, what did not we'll, um, we'll have a look into that. <laughs> yeah, and also if you want to translate it or you want to translate sections, we have adopted quite a lot of things from other um, uh, areas as well. So, for example, the, the, the section about um, open science, I took it from the Open Science Handbook because um, there's no point in reinventing the wheel. So if you attribute accordingly, uh, it's fine. Just go translate, use, use piece. It's, it's, it's just, it's just, it's an OER there. You know, the, the work is there. Um, yeah. And um, Leo, if you can move forward. Um, of course, if you have find if you have an issue with with the um, 
with the website, just let us know. Um, and if you want to learn to use, or you want to help us, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I have such a bad cold. <laughs> I'm trying to speak and I can't. Um, if you want to run a workshop and you need support or training into running a workshop, let us know, we're happy to help. So. May I, Javiera, may I say something short? So as not to interrupt? Yeah, yeah, please. Um, no, the thing is, I am designing a, a class, a course for secondary education, secondary students. And I was looking for, then I let you know how I kind of work it, how, how can I put it all together? I am looking for activities or, or input or materials. I think this is the place. That's why I am kind of processing everything, the, the, the readings and all the materials, especially the canvas. Um, I am looking for activities and materials that I can use for, I don't know, a month or two months so that I have students do some research into the, the data field and develop some, some literacies and skills, but I still can't grasp, let's say, the, um, the core of the issue, right? Where is based? To... Argentina. So I okay, think we are great, very because... close. No, 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 this is something because I'm running another project in parallel. Hey, why not? We just call Aprender con Datos, which is led actually by people from the University of Buenos Aires, um, which is tailored for secondary education. We are just running three pilots now, Argentina, Uruguay, and Chile, and they are running. And it's actually a kind of data literacy project for secondary schools. So if you drop me an email, I'll put you in contact with Caro Grufat who's leading the project because basically there is a toolkit just designed for secondary schools. So Lovely. Drop, yeah, Thank drop you. me a line. Okay. And I think some of the most inspirational work that we've seen at the when we first started um, researching this topic was actually in the context of secondary um, education. Um, in uh, there was a sort of fantastic project um, in in Italy where the um, resources were provided um, sort of as a in the form of a of like a MOOC to the teachers who were then able to um, sort of deliver the curriculum. Um, to, to their students and um, and, get, and really give the students this, the skills to do to do some of this kind of data research. So um, so it definitely you know sometimes when we've talked about this at conferences, people have questioned you know isn't this uh, you know really advanced level kind of work? And I think I think you can you can do some kind of work in this area at any level. And you know a lot of it is just about. A lot of what we're getting at is really the conceptual part, anyway. But also, you know, you can start learning this sort of data skills, certainly in secondary. So that sounds really exciting. What you're doing, Mariana. Thanks for um, for sharing that with us. And um, Javi, um, we did you want to talk about the the data skills slide? Oh yeah, sorry. No, I was I was actually looking for for the details for Mariana. I will send you the, the package for uh, the Seval project and for the Italian project. Because also Luigi Reggi, who's the podcast guy, is one of the leaders of, of that pro project and it's for secondary schools and it's awesome. So uh, going back to what I was supposed to, to talk now is um, um, normally when we talk about data skills and um, and this is not beyond, on, this is not at the technicalities of like data management because this is kind of a separate set of skills that normally are superpowers of librarians. Um, but when we talk about how, which are the skills that normally the researchers and academics are expected to have around data skills, is bits of basics of, of data collection. So how to obtain, retrieve, or kind of recollect data from different sources. And those sources include human sources. Um, how to curate data, so how to organize and tailor that, how to store it and create databases where you can conduct research through, through such data. Analyze the data from basic simple analysis uh, until complex stuff like um, from data science. Um, how to publish the data. And this is becoming more and more crucial uh, when we think about the mandates for open, um, for open science and open access that actually some journals are demanding and some universities are demanding that you publish the data alongside the uh, papers that you're publishing and how to showcase data. So how you portray 
your information in a graphic way. So that's data visualization skills. And how you tell and narrate stories around the data, how you portray the data on a paper. So this is basically called data storytelling. This is basically the toolkit in which any researcher at higher education level is expected to have. Um, this doesn't include the superpower of librarians, uh, which are way more complex and the work that they do nowadays, for example, with fair research, also with fair protocols and data management plans uh, in open science is just amazing. So if, if we move forward a little bit, Leo, please. Um, Leo and Chris, I leave that to you. So really, I w wanted to just, be, um, thinking about that um, data skills um, slide, um, I, uh, we, we've, we've been doing this, this kind of next pro project or next kind of phase that we're, that we're kind of talking about now about the, um, the data ethics. It's kind of building, fr building from our project, but moving, uh, kind of moving on from it. And part of, part of that has involved um, looking into what kind of data skills are being taught. Um, and uh, Javier has done a big investigation of different um, curricula for um, research methods uh, and um, data science and things like this. And, um, and we found that there is, a, there is an awful lot um, of focus on those data skills, on the really like, the, 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 like data practices. Um, and um, generally let rather less focus on the social context of data and on the data ethics. And so, so that's, um, which is kind of as we suspected, but it's quite interesting to, to have it confirmed by um, kind of um, actually seeing what's, what's going on in the wild, as it were. Um, and um, so, so yeah, so data literacy is quite often quite often used to refer to these data skills that we mentioned before, but we think it's, um, and then so it's th thought of much like literacy in general, where, you know, literacy is kind of reading and writing skills, um, but um, it's thought about, thought of as being the competencies in working with data, but we also mean it more broadly and more critically. Um, and, and we actually think it's a requirement for kind of participation. And we mean that as a sort of a, 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 a democratic, um, kind of uh, con con concept, not only in terms of voting, but really in terms of really being able to engage in today's uh, datafied society. So it's not not simply about um, it, it's not simply about having um, skills, but also having some criticality to unpack what are other people trying to do with data. What are the what 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 stories are they telling us with data, and how how credible. Um, are they, or you know, how you know to, to what extent might might we think that there might be other stories, or there might be data that's missing, even if the data that there, so the, the idea that that you know very often data is sort of held up as this like it's a collection of facts, it's simply you know factual neutral information, and um, and so really we we are you know um, concerned about helping people have the tools to unpack that idea a bit more. Um, and we also think that um, we, we need a much stronger focus on, um, on the ethics of data and working, working with it. Um, so I think this leads into this next one. Yeah, so with uh, data ethics, there has been a, a, a lot of calls now for, um, because, of, because of people seeing a lot of harmful impacts of datafication, there is a lot of talk going on around um, people need, a, need more data ethics training. There should be more ethical training in data science. Um, they're, they're, sometimes it, it, it comes in the form of that we need to have more people with humanities degrees and things like that, which, uh, you know, which I agree with, but it's sort of, it's all a bit kind of a general um, idea of um, what, you know, not very specific about what, what are these people going to, going to do. Um, and um, at times it kind of feels like there's a bit of, a, of an ethics washing um, where um, as long as we can now say like, well, yeah, and, you know, in week seven, we, um, we have some slides about ethics or, you know, we have a sort of an ethical um, framework that we refer to. Uh, and um, some, some of the ethical frameworks also are quite sort of superficial, like it's like make sure you're not breaking the law and things like this. So 
Um, so we we took inspiration from um, a um, an article which referred to ethics as um, as a method, and really um, was kind of reframing the question of ethics instead of being being a, a kind of a a stage or a step that you need to pass through when you're doing some piece of research or some kind of data work. Um, and really was saying, what about embedding ethics throughout the cycle of the work that you're doing? Um, Chris, this one. Okay. In, uh, yeah, why, why it's so important to have a solid knowledge on, uh, on ethics, on, on, on how to apply the main concept, is that we need to go beyond this idea of tick boxes. So in, in the example we have in the slide, in, it could be simple in a tick box item and instead where I just take in respect privacy by asking some in, uh, in a random question and uh, saying, well, this should be enough. But if with an ethics background in, in uh, with some knowledge on the ethical questions, in, we go into deeper question. For example, do the affected population have a similar understanding of privacy than than we as researchers do, or or do ha they have another conception? So this is particularly important for in uh, if one does field work in uh, in uh, with indigenous communities that sometimes have a communal understanding of privacy, where if uh, one person discloses information, it affects the other people. In, this is in a particularly a, a large problem in medicine, but also in other fields. It, because in the, the collection of data from one group may affect others in the group. So in, it could be that just one per person consented, but the other, the rest of the groups if in, uh, would be similarly affected. It's in, uh, Thinks that their privacy has been invaded, and and this is why it's important that in uh, that if people really feel that the privacy has been violated, so it's beyond the part of the tick box, and because we ask the uh, wrong questions, and they may stop the sharing data, or even attempt to block an entire project. So this is also something that in. Uh, if we don't, we don't take in uh, the expression of respect and privacy seriously, it could in uh, come back at us as researchers, in uh, or for future researchers who want to in, uh, do studies in, in uh, with the same group of people. Leo, can you show the next one, please? In here, it's important to in. Uh, for when we talk about embracing ethics as a method, that in the to combine this part of ethical data practice and the link it has with good scientific practice. And uh, here, can you go to the next one, Leo? And for that, it is important that we gain this wider in. Uh, this bigger ethical picture and uh, be aware in, in how many different dimensions in our current data practices can affect in uh, others. So there's the, the issue of respecting uh, for per, uh, respect for autonomy, which is only one. Then the other part is in how in uh, our data collection will in uh, benefit other or even harm them on the, on this uh, to ethical principles of beneficence and non maleficence So to have a good intentions for the, with the data used and to not, not harm anyone. There is a larger social justice dimension on justice in, uh, for, in uh, for distribution of benefits and uh, for process when we design data policies that are inclusive. So in uh, it's, it is usually understood that we should not only in collect in data and for our own benefits, but try to as much as possible that also the communities that donated the data in uh, have some benefits at that. And this in uh, comes in line with the same widely 
an accepted principle with, from access and benefit sharing. Then it's also about relationships. So if, in, uh, if we don't take in uh, seriously data providers and try to build uh, our honest with them and maintain a trustful relationship, we can have in, uh, a bad in, uh, effects on the on future in uh, cooperation opportunities. And the part of accuracy, incentive, and integrity is also here in uh, part of research ethics because in, we will be using this data as researchers in, for a particular purpose, but the whole scientific enterprise is working that others will continue to uh, build up on our data. So if we in, uh, are not careful on how we um, show the data provided, it will, in, uh, it's likely that others will in, uh, fail to understand it and, and misrepresent it or, in, uh, or leave mistakes for a very long time until others really figured out what went wrong. And uh, Leo, can you go to the next one, please? So here we have to look at in data ethics as a in a, as something that's really embedded in a, in a circle with good science. So anything what's in a good ethical principles in a, that we also know from other disciplines, for example, in medicine again, the quite an important in a part of informed consent in uh, when we are collecting data in uh, are the donors aware of that in uh, the principle of non-discrimination inclusive participation and participative process and benefit sharing in maintaining those good ethical principles will again pay out in in the part of that we have a good science and that we have accurate results and here we have to align the same part of good scientific practices, such as diversification of sources, reduction of biases, facilitated independent peer review, no fabrication, falsification of data, and transparency. The data gain will de deliver in a data that's in accurate and uh, diverse enough to benefit in uh, the overall in uh, public. So in both part of in uh, what's considered data ethics and good scientific in practice in uh, cannot be really taken as something in uh, independent, they build on each other. So we need to pay attention that both are really in uh, addressed. And Leo, this would be in uh, Carus in right Carus. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you, um, Chris. And I'm aware of the time and I know we have things that we would like the audience to participate. So this slide really only reiterates what um, Javi, Leo and Chris have been saying, just the importance of having data ethics. We don't need to think about just basic skills, but the more critical side of data ethics is very, very, so sorry for data literacy is very, very important. So that we um really have this this i don't know how the mindset that's the word i was looking for the mindset of data ethics is more than ticking a box or filling a form or just complying with some requirements is about thinking of all of these kind of dimensions that data has and the ones that we have been talking about and thinking about them deliberately and with the tools also that in a way are provided through this um, the presentation. So I, I am gonna, we can jump to the next because I think we have said that already and, and maybe we need a bit more time for people to participate. At the end, I mean now. Yeah, Chris, I think this one is yours, but maybe we can, we can move a bit forward as well. Um, because one of the things that, um, yeah, this is kind of the different approach. We're gonna leave everything open and with lots of links. So you, you can read them later. Uh, Chris? Yeah, no, no, I, I just wanted to say in the slide before 
it's actually the only one that's in uh, the most important one and that to uh, in uh, why is ethics important so in uh, just to in uh, wrap up there are the moral reasons in the part of what we should be about fairness about justice in uh, that we do need to inform people because it's the right to be informed the instrumental about in uh, potential risk to avoid in uh, that in uh, our in research is cancelled in the part of pragmatic by in uh, following the, the processes we we can revise our methods and it helps us to figure out again if we are on the right track and this the only part have you yeah um well one of the things that we did uh because we of course yes as i said we love reading we combined different strands of um, elements to come with an, an kind of a data literacy framework that was grounded on ethics and, 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 and other elements that basically are um, kind of feeding into a less technocratic approach to data. Because one of the issues with data is, and, and data is, data is terribly technocratic, while ethics at, at in academia tend to be like a checkbook exercise. One of the things that we did is to look into different authors that approach ethics and consent and use of data uh, in, from different eras. So for example, in the case of, of Floridi is the concept of, of bring, bringing everything from bioethics or philosophical ethics into how, how data should be used for good. Um, Kukutai and Taylor, they talk about indigenous um, data and the right of sovereignty, their right of uh, independence and control of their own data and their own narratives. Um, <coughs> so coming back to the concept of preventing colonial, colonialism, digital colonialism into the data, and it, it includes biomedical data from indigenous communities. The work that the Ignacio and Klein are doing with data feminism, the principles of feminism are challenging power structure, making labor invisible, and, and something that Catherine Ignacio says that is quite interesting. Remove ourselves from the extractive language that dominates the word of, of, of the wor the world of data, which is mining, extracting, taking, which is basically quite, mm, we'll say, quite negative because it talks about extracting data instead of like gathering data and talking to others and um, collecting or composing data sets. Never, not talks about composing a data set that needs an orchestra of people to talk together, to, but it just talk about extracting and mining, which kind of hardcore um, extractive uh, data. So <laughs> the concept of research ethics, which is something that we all kind of tend to learn in, in, in university, but also, Another set of technocratic, mostly frameworks that are re regulating um, the world of algorithmics, alg algorithms, and, and artificial intelligence, which is artificial intelligence ethics. Um, they talk mostly in, in the ones that are really good are um, talking about human centered values and transparency and fairness. So, how do we bring all, all these together into creating a framework that enhances research to make research for good in the society? So if we can move forward, Leo, please. What we did was we combined different frameworks, different strands, actually our own reflection. So we came back with this uh, critical and data ethics framework uh, for, for data literacy. <coughs> oh, bye, Jen. I hope to see you soon. I hope you see you saw us. So go on, think based at some point. Um, so one, one of the things that we, we turn, it's, it's when we work with data, one of the things that we need to look into mostly when, for example, we, we, we work with educational data, we all come from the educational sector. Um, it's it's challenge power structures, how we are oppressing the students through um, unfair learning analytics, how we address equality, how we respect the privacy of the people that is giving us their time and their space for um, to enter into their world to, to gather information for our own research, how we address the biases in the data and actually our own biases 
And, and so this is basically what we're trying to do. And we're exploring how much impact this can have to enhance the work of, of researchers. It does include our own work. Uh, Leo? So we want to hear from you because actually I'm struggling with my voice again. <laughs> uh, we want to hear from you um, some questions about how you've been struggling with data ethics in your work. What have, which challenges, dilemmas, complications are you encountering? And see how we can help each other to, to resolve them. So Leo, you are the mentee. So it's still the same link, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> hope it's working. Let me, let me try to find it, but if anyone wants to say something, please, please, please talk. Um, actually, I, I wanted to tell a quick story about this. So, um, so yeah, so this, uh, my, my idea here was to try to bring, bring this um, discussion back to actually thinking about our own research ethics as um, maybe as um, doctoral researchers or um, postdoctoral or um, you know whatever in whatever way that we we have come into this conversation um, uh, we we all um, have to face different kinds of ethical um, challenges and um, ethical dilemmas um, even even just the, simply the ones that involve um, you know filling in the ethics forms for example um, and the sometimes the um, the seeming um, maze of questions that ask us, have we already done this thing or that thing? And we have to work out what this thing or that thing is. Um, Martin knows what I'm talking about, <laughs> what I'm referring to here. Um, and, um, and at times it, it feels, um, you know, it feels a bit like you're kind of um, try, trying to find your way through a maze. And, you know, I've even felt this way myself, although um, I actually, you know, know quite a lot about this, I think. So I, I think that this is this is a, um, a struggle that people have. And I'm wondering, um, you know, have you struggled with trying to figure out um, any knotty challenges around your data, around whether you're able to get the data that you're wanting to get, um, whether, you, wh wh you know, problems with, with um, you know, any aspects of, um, of, um, you know, storing it, handling it. Um, one, one of the things, for example, that is quite fun, I'm on the other side of, of that, I'm in the receiving end. I'm part of the ethics committee, yeah? Uh, and one of the things that it really saddens me and my colleagues because we want to change a bit of on, on, on the work of the ethics committee is we're not allowed to give advice. We just have to go through the forms, check if they comply or not, and then tell them to rework and resubmit uh, the proposal. Or move, or, or move on. But we are not allowed to, to sit down with the people and say, okay, this is what you should be doing. Let me see how we can improve. Uh, and, and I think the role of the ethics committee needs to be, again, beyond the tick box. It needs to be a capacity building area within the universities. Not just the secretary okay. person that sits around on Fridays reading forms. I dread ethics forms. I think I relate. I relate to this point. Thank you. Um, does anybody want to um, talk about their point that they've made here? Please, please do. Open mic, please. We can give you the power of speech. It's Martin. I'll make a quick point there. I think this isn't really on the dealing with the, the data specifically, but it's more about the kind of how we frame it. I kind of find it quite difficult to get a, a kind of balanced approach as to kind of data. Data is God kind of people, you know, like all the all the data ethic, all the data boys kind of thing. And then there's also 
lot of us, I think we're reacting against that. We tend to be very critical. You know, and, and um, you know, I think you started off the session saying like, what are the buzzwords and stuff? And that, which kind of all sound like, you know, as if like working with data was kind of inherently evil. I don't think that, that isn't what you were saying, but you know, I think we, so we end up, I think kind of end up being a bit in two camps as the kind of like data will solve everything. And then there's, you know, a, a kind of camp at the other extreme. So, you know, we'll stop being so obsessed with data and stuff. And I think trying to tell good stories about data I think is, is an interesting thing. And we don't often do that. We have lots of horror stories, you know, about how data has been useful in helping students learn and sort of like do useful interventions, those kind of things. So um, I hadn't really got a, a solution to that, but I just wondered if you'd sort of come across that as you were developing this material as well, sort of trying to get that, that balance right. Yeah, I, th I think crit criticality doesn't have to be negative. You, 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 we need to, kind of try to empower people to use data safely and, and, and wisely. And I think this is, this is what we've been, been trying to do. Um, explain that the harms that they may cause, so people just not embrace the data um, to get, um, uh, uh, to code Alexa to do the homework for the, for the students. <laughs> um, it's just to empower the, the academics into developing assignment and assessment and developing teaching with data that actually helps up to, to deal with society problems rather than uh, automating solutions for stuff. And, and, you know, sorry, if I can say something, I think also, Martin, what you're saying is, is what we, I think there is, there was, and there still is, um, like a tsunami of bad examples of abuses of data collection data use, micro-targeting, you know, you name it, Cambridge Analytica, the Facebook um, files, blah, blah, blah. So I think also the problem is that the moment in which we are living and this, you know, this is not, I'm not saying today, I'm saying already a year ago, it was really the tsunami of, of the book of surveillance capitalism and how Shushana has, you know, set and presented incredible, you know, happening life examples. So what I think is, that one was overwhelmed of how badly data can be used. And then I think also data sovereignty and the whole movement of indigenous people, which has been scaling up, thanks God, as well. You know, they have now acquired a voice and they have opened to the public the abuses and the, and the bad uses. Of, so what I think here, yes, data can serve incredibly good causes and that's great, but the moment I think is particular in what we're doing because the moment really has shown us things that we didn't see before. And I think that makes a difference. It doesn't, it doesn't um, overlook or shadow the good things that you can do with even algorithm intelligence, you know, the health advantages that that in plants, whatever, you name it, they're wonderful things. But what I think is more obvious than it was before is how badly it can be used. And I think that that is like our work is our response to that in a way. I think that is a, that's a context, I, I think. Yeah. Thank you, Caro. Yeah, and, and it is true. And I think this is a time for reflect and then um, just pick up the good guidelines and start building up good research. Um, you know, can you move forward, please? I think we have another question. I really want to open up the, 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 the mic um, for how you were dealing with, with your data conundrums now. Um, we, we have some, some guides in here how to plan for research and how to kind of select your data sources carefully. I think what we what we have um, is uh, kind of um, some some different slides about different different aspects um, of um, of re researching um, and the the you know, your ethics of um, of data across the kind of um, research process. Um, but we might we might just want to leave it open for more um, comments and discussion. Um, and just share the slides with you. What do you think, Kathy? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, actually, because we're also testing these tools. 
So we, 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 we need your input. Otherwise we'll be talking in a loop for, <laughs> for no reason if it was happens. Um, so what we're trying to do is like to help you think about how you kind of embrace the different elements of, of this critical data literacy, ethical data uh, framework into respect the autonomy, how you enter someone else's space. So for example, if you work with vulnerable communities, how are you gonna enter this space? Because normally their spaces, uh, when we work with very vulnerable communities, for example, the, the trans students, they, they, they tend to kind of keep themselves very close in a safe space. If we enter those safe spaces to study their needs, how do we enter it safely? How we protect them? How we protect um, the students from marginal communities? How, is, how we work with students that have been victims of, of domestic violence in the campus, in, in the area that we work, which is academia, but how we work beyond the, 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 the education field, how we work with the cases that Christian studied in, in bio, biomedical eth ethics, how we work with um, different, how we train academics with open science stuff, um, with data. And this is an interesting conversation that we had with, with David Carpenter, uh, who was one of the, is one of the leading ethicists for the Oxford vaccine. Um, I, I've asked him in, um, in, in, a, in, in a presentation, in, in a conversation that he had at my university, if I'm gonna open up data and I obtain consent from my participants for a study, how do I tell them that then I will open up that data for other people to use it um, for all the research? Because maybe this person is giving me consent for my own, for my specific, research because I gain trust with that community. But then I'm just gonna go to the Zenodo picture and open up that data without telling the community uh, the data after life. Um, how, how do we deal with that? And I know Paula, uh, uh, because she works with a colleague out of mine in Chile, in Ricardo, how, for example, Paula, would you deal, how would you train um, academics into opening up their data and looking into the consent for third party uses. Um, I really want to hear from you because we really need to also kind of puzzle bits that are missing in our heads. Well, actually that was uh, one of the challenges I posted in the Mentimeter, informed consent. So they are so crucial when you work with uh, personal data, qualitative data. I, I do not do research with those kind of data. I work in the research data management field and providing training also on research data management to PhD students. And that is what we, we often see that um, informed consents are, are not really, um, I don't think they receive the attention they should receive, especially if we as an institution are asking to open up the data to really make our students to think um, what is the best way to set up an informed consent and get involved with the participants be transparent and make sure that they know that you want to publish the data after your research is finished, which is actually one of the requirements for PhD students at UW Delft. Um, so I don't have the right answer. And I was also very curious to hear uh, your opinions about an experience on informed consent. Yeah, um, this, this is exactly what I've asked uh, David. Uh, and, and I was like, how do I inform a community, for example, and, and I was leading a, a kind of supporting someone's work on, on um, mapping with a, a vulnerable community. So she was working on a guide on um, ethics of uh, geolocalization, the geolocalization data. So how you open up data for, for example, for abortion clinics and people told me where kind of information about the clinics, how they operate. Uh, but then they haven't given you the consent to just open it up. They maybe have given you the consent to study them, but not to open it up and then create a mouth about it because then those people will be harassed. So it's, it's, it's quite difficult. How do we deal with that? I don't know what maybe Martin thinks and, and everyone else in the room. We really need to hear from here. Just to, Rob, Rob Farrell here, another philosopher. What, what do you think? Please help us. It's, Hello. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, 
what do I think? I think it's complicated, right? Um, there's definitely a balance to be struck between really getting involved in kind of fundamental ethical reflection about things and the practicality, I suppose, of the tick box method. Um, I think, I mean, personally, I favor introducing more kind of ethical philosophy into stuff, but I recognize that it's not like feasible for everyone to be a philosopher, right? And still get stuff done because you end up just doing philosophy all the time. So what I've tried to do in my own work is try and get that balance right in the framework that you're bringing to a particular task or whatever, and trying to sort of encourage that kind of reflection at the right sort of level. I don't think it's necessarily solved or anything like that. Um, and I can see he, there's always another approach that with ethics that you can kind of introduce. A um, couple of general observations. I think the, the checkbox method, which I'm not particularly a fan of, it can be pretty useful for some things. It's primarily about risk though. It's primarily about risk and the transference of risk from an institution onto an individual, right? So you have to say, I, I, I did what I was supposed to, I thought about the things that I was supposed to. Um, and the institution can say, well, we, we advise you to do that. So great. And if you messed it up, then hmm, we'll have to have a look at that. Um, so I think uh, it sort of sets the wrong tone for this stuff, right? Because then it becomes about escaping the blame if something goes wrong. Um, and to me, that's not where you want to start from necessarily. Um, the other thing I was going to say, I think, I like the, the stuff around seeing this more as a sort of process rather than um, an event, right? So you, I've done the ethics now, I ticked that box and moved on from it. To me, this is an, around, this is an issue around, as you say, it's a sort of literacy really. It's, you know, what kind of things do we expect people who are data professionals one way or another, what kind of things do we expect them to be able to do? What kind of thoughts do we expect them to be having? I don't think that that's about checkboxes. That's about culture. That's about the culture around research and around um, sharing data. Um, and I think if we pursue this kind of checkbox approach too much, which I'm not saying anyone here is advocating, we end up um, not being able to um, but you basically are on the side of caution, manage all risk away by just not doing anything, right? Just, just don't release any data because that's the most effective way to manage the risk. Um, but it doesn't seem like that can be the answer, right? Um, so, so yeah, there's a lot of different balancing, balancing acts to bring into play. And I think partly, I mean, if, to take a sort of philosophical angle on it, it's partly a sort of Aristotelian style virtue, right? Practice and habit eventually your judgment gets better around this stuff. Um, but you can't really generalize too much around the rules and the sort of um, the formalities around it. You kind of have to just stay engaged and stay reflective. Yeah, so for me, for example, like first year a PhD student have to deal with the forms, couldn't understand anything. Um, and, and I didn't understand kind of the, the, the whys and why should I be doing all this and without any support in training and then now it's even more forums that you have to comply because I did my PhD pre-GDPR oh my god but imagine now it's like it's very complicated and people is not not being trained on that um I don't know uh Chris if you have something in mind I actually do I uh, I was kind of interested in uh well it was interesting to hear uh, uh, Robert is another philosopher. So if we go back to the part of addressing biases and then I uh, also have to self-reflect from where I'm thinking. And much of the work I did earlier involved agriculture. So often when I, I uh, think about data, I see it as a, as a resource that needs to be sustainably harvested. 
and I built my ethics and uh, ideas on, on informed consent in on uh, on fairness and in uh, to, in autonomy in order to be able to to be, make use of this harvest and not only for, if, in the present but also in the future generation. So something that's say a uh, really uh, key part in in farming and growing food that you need to in uh, take care of the soil and take care of your in um, in of the bees and and all the other in uh, insects that are providing ecosystem service and uh, taking this in a perspective i uh, don't think as much about issues of risk than other philosophers who might work more with technology are used to so i think one of the key parts is to in uh, analyze your data practices in with other people with a different background, because in that way you will identify in a, a much larger set of in, uh, problems and in a much larger set of opportunities on why this data has to be or can be used. Yes, Fabi? Yeah, and, and also for me, and, and because of, of, of the side gigs I, I do with governments, when they open up the data uh, and it's been a, a boom of like opening up everything, sometimes without any consideration and something that it's been happening now with, with COVID is actually bringing these sort of academic guidelines into the people that open up the, the data from the governments, <laughs> the association of merchandise world product, maybe we should. Um, it's, it's just to tell government officials that also, just because you have the power and the mandate to open up data, you need to be careful when you open data in specific situations because it's very easy to expose a population. Um, uh, Chris and I come from, from a country that has a very un, unevenly distributed population. So we're both from Chile. Everyone lives in Santiago and there is very little people that live in other cities. So if you want to open up data for the people that live in the small cities and you want to say something about the health of these people, you will identify them in three. Because you don't, you know where they live, you know who they are. So, and I won't even talk about the situation in, 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 in Uruguay because they are like three million people. So, how to deal with opening up data, and they can be quite confidential data, or sensitive data on very small chunks of population. So, this is something that needs to be applied for any sort of data work, not only academia, but also kind of government and 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 um, all the institutions. Yeah, and we're gonna have a business like, yeah, we're gonna sell t-shirts, data t-shirts. Uh, anyone has questions? For me, for Chris, for Leo, for Garo. Are you exhausted? I think we've, we've kept you here for a long time. Um, you're probably all ready for, um, you know, Coffee, gin and tonic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Can I just, I, maybe I, just quickly share something that I was thinking about when we were talking about uh, bias. Um, and we tend to say like the researcher's own bias comes through in the in the algorithm or something like that. And I wonder if that's necessarily helpful because um, it seems to me that it's often a property of the context rather than the researcher themselves and their own kind of personal prejudices or biases. And of course that affects what data sets they use to, to train a bit of software or whatever, or, um, but it doesn't necessarily, but it, it's, it's more a reflection of that entire context rather than the individual researcher's own biases. And I'm not sure if it's just sort of slip of the tongue when we kind of say, the way we say it, it's like, oh, the research, researcher's got biases. Um, but you might have the best will in the world, I suppose. I'm not saying you can escape bias, um, yeah. but it's- Yeah, I think it's-, it's, it's a... to, to, Sorry, just to finish quickly. I was thinking what you're saying about the ecosystem though. And in, in some ways it's, it's a feature of parts of that ecosystem or you know, what, what bits are connected to what other bits? Where can you train an, uh, an AI? Um, what data have you got to, to, to sort of practice on? Um, and I, I think, yeah, the ecosystem thing is a good way of looking at it you know um there is no sort of 
abstract rarefied place where this stuff happens it's always somewhere and and to say rob's um what you're saying i i was wanting to exactly say that i believe it has a lot to do with what are you working on and who you are so it's not about bad intentions but it's about unintended consequences of good intentions if you wish if you are for example someone that has always it, the example let's go even backwards the example of uh, woman voting if you don't have any woman representation in any government then women are just erased from policy because they are not represented there and the thing the same thing happens with data sets so if who you are in a way defines what data are you going to collect or what data is valid for you or even what is at hand to you and not necessarily you have a, a variety of data sets that represent a lot of people because that's not reality you have to work to get them so what i think here is that bias is inherently in us it's not a bad thing but i think that we need to be aware that we have that and so who else do we bring to the table when we're thinking in a massive project with seven countries and collecting, I don't know, thousands of data, then we need to think about, okay, who is in the table with us and which is the data we need to collect in order to maybe train this particular um, algorithms. So what I think is good intentions don't necessarily guarantee, good work, if that makes sense, or representation or inclusion. And I think that we need to be aware of that. And just to do things about it, not not demonize it or, you know, it's just being conscious and what can we do? I think this is what we are wanting to do with what we're creating. I think that that is it. May I add on that quickly? Yes. Yes. So I, uh, I think in, uh, so there, there, uh, we, we put the bias part as address bias that in, uh, that there are certain biases in, uh, that we should simply be aware and uh, try to reduce them as much as possible. But it is interesting that in uh, the authors on data feminism actually um, put this contextualization as something uh, central. So I, I do think that we need to uh, discuss this a little bit further if this address bias and contextualization can be in uh, combined or is it this in, in uh, into new category or uh, or how we should do that so there i think if we take data out of context in uh, we uh, it is in uh, possibly as harmful as in uh, having in uh, data with certain biases in it in especially in algorithms so in, uh, thank you again for that point. Well, I think we're gonna keep working on this. I think we're gonna, we're gonna keep, um, we'll have to go now. I, I got like 15 emails in the time that we were talking. Um, so um, I think, uh, I want to thank everyone and please, please send us your reflections. We cannot progress in our thinking or in our research without your input. So at some point, we're gonna to wanna to have a coffee with, 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 with you. And if you have questions, suggestions, just, just get, get in touch with us. We, we're writing some more papers about this. So um, any input is, is welcome. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. Thank um, you much. Just like to say a big thank you from everyone that was on the call today. Um, it was a fantastic, lots of food for thought. I know we're gonna continue the discussions beyond um, today's but a really big thank you to Javier, Leo, Caro and Christian for today's workshop it's been really awesome um, so thank you so much so yeah